Well, I'm going to read you um, a couple different places. This is a little bit different because it deals a lot with my family of origin and uh, my young years. And a lot, of, a lot of people wondered how did she get to do what she does? Was she raised by wolves? Was she raised by nuns? By hedonists? And it's sort of all three, <laughs> as, as you will see. And I'm going to take a, a page here. At, at one point, I've been in Detroit, and there's been a, a, kind of a brutal scene has gone down. And I move to Louisville, Kentucky, which at that time in the 70s, in 76, was the site of a great deal of uh, political tension uh, because of uh, they were trying to integrate the schools. And uh, it wasn't. Uh, Yes, it's a difficult place to be, as you'll hear. Then I'll read a little something um, as I approach the On Our Backs era. Mm -hmm. And then I'll talk yeah, yeah. Well, with you guys. We'll, we'll, fit, we'll fit everything in. And excuse me for, I just learned these are called lorgnettes. <laughs> Did Auntie Mame wear lorgnettes? Or just a cigarette holder? I'm not sure. I guess I have to go back to this. You're discussing the Lord yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the glasses themselves because they're half and half. Mm -hmm. It's a little disorienting. I have to kind of look up, look down, look up, look down. It's, okay. it's part of the, the shittiness of old age that I'm getting accustomed to. This is called the perfume counter. My first order of business in Louisville was to find a job. I rented a cheap carriage house apartment in St. James Court where I subsisted on one can of tuna per day. As before in Detroit, no local comrade could help me find a job because they were already known to their employers as communists and nigger lovers. I turned in my applications as a complete stranger. My references were 2,000 miles away, would you like to call them? No one did. My appearance was deceiving. The first position I found, I discovered in the Courier Journal of Classifieds. It was for a stock clerk at the largest department store in town, Bix, which reminded me of the old I Magnum in San Francisco. Do any of you have, was there ever a fancy ladies department store here? That was just, just <laughs> the Fancy ladies and music. No. <laughs> seen since junior high. It asked the meanings and contexts of words like ancillary and infrequent. There were some arithmetic questions and a story problem about a squirrel that went to a party. <laughs> I had to squirm instead of giggle because Miss Draco was sitting 10 feet away from me. The test had nothing to do with fashion. I was hoping she would say, who's your favorite designer? <laughs> or how do you make a Dior rose? As long as it was impossible for me to get a job in one of the major industries, I might as well enjoy my other interests, like fashion. No one ever asked me those kind of questions in my socialist group. <laughs> or maybe no one asked because of the way I looked those days. Certainly not a Dior rose. I was white, but no debutante. I appeared before Miss Drakel in an acrylic striped sweater and denim skirt, ribbed, pill tights, and scuffed Mary Jane. I was 19. Miss Drakel had me sit in front of her at a tiny desk with a built-in chair like a Catholic schoolgirl while she graded my paper. You seem to be quite intelligent, she said, peering over her glasses. She probably was peering over her lorgnette. Yes. I'm going to change that in the next edition. Are you planning to attend college in the future? 
sounded like a trick question. <laughs> yes, ma'am, but I need to work right now. You will be assisting Miss Love, our couture buyer. She will require your courtesy and attention at all times. She needs a smart girl. Miss Love? A special sauce, I hoped. <laughs> I was put to work in a back room, filling out inventory cards with a group of five other young women, each of whom lived with either her father or her husband. You didn't need to know a thing to do this job except how to count to 20. All the girls who lived with their parents were engaged, except Shelley, who was almost engaged and in a panic about her reign. Shannon, the youngest, had been engaged at 16 and had been pulled from high school when busing started. Well, my father put his foot down, she explained, as everyone else nodded. Of course. I don't know any girls who haven't left, she added. More vigorous agreement. I went to the socialist meeting that night and asked Katrina, a local girl, to spell it out for me. Did they mean that their fathers are afraid they'll have a black boyfriend or something? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way they put it, she said. They'd say, no, nigger's going to rape my little girl. Oh, come on. I was serious. So if someone's dad doesn't pull his daughter out, that means he wants her to get raped? Yeah, well, it's the end of public schools as far as they're concerned. But this girl I work with didn't even get through 10th grade. <laughs> Neither did you, Katrina said, and poked me in the side. She had graduated from with honors from Oberlin. That's different. I went to Pinko U instead. It was hard to be ringless at Bix. I've never had so much attention paid to my bare hands. I got asked if I had a boyfriend, and I stuttered. They must have thought I was either frigid or a prostitute. Well, of course, I was a Yankee, and Yankee girls don't have anyone looking after them, which is why they are frigid whores. <laughs> I could not say to them, well, I'm having sex with the girl branch organizer and the head of the Teamster Caucus after our meeting, sometimes the two of them together, but it's not serious. <laughs>